My name's Jesse Randall. I am uh, an extension forester and the director of research for Michigan State University. Uh, I am based now out of Escanaba, Michigan uh, at their Forestry Research Center. And before that, I spent 11 years at Iowa, uh, at Iowa State University in the Department of Forestry as a professor. And so a lot of the slides you're gonna see are uh, throughout my time at, at Iowa and the start of, of being at Michigan. And pretty much everything in the slides you can find in Wisconsin or they're knocking at your door and you should be looking at. Um, this talk will cover a lot of the most common ones, the ones that we want you to be out looking for. It's gonna cover fairly detailed ways of, and, and at first I titled it invasive plants, ID, and if it grows, we can kill it, okay? So it also is going to be somewhat of a manual of how to go about eradicating these things when you do find them. And unfortunately, when we talk about invasives, very few of them can we do with mechanical means or with a natural means of fire. We're normally talking about some form of chemical use. And when we talk about chemical use, I try to give you the most efficient method, but also talk to you a little bit about problems you're gonna run into, safety factors you should be aware of, and, and judicious use of chemical rather than wholesale wanton spraying. Um, and some of the times, if you don't do it right, you make your life 10 times worse because they, go, they just get mad at you. Um, and so really on the back half of this talk, uh, is more like a manual. If you know what the plant is, you can go to this and say, all right, I want to spray it. What do I use? How much do I use? When do I apply it? And so you don't want to stand up or I don't want to stand up here and click through those and say, okay, this is what you want to do here. This is what you want to do here. That's going to be boring for all of us. And so I would rather have it be an interactive at each of the slides where if you have questions or comments, or if you have some of these plants and you've tried something that has either worked or not, let us know and ask questions. Uh, we're here for the next 45 to 50 minutes, um, probably on the shorter end of at least what is formally presented because I, again, I'd rather you go back to this and use it as a reference than me just standing up here with a, a manual of, of how, do we, how do we kill these things. But we've already covered this one. Um, this is Japanese hops, this plant you know, right here. It, you know, we refer to it as the kudzu of the north uh, because it is taking over those spots. And when, when we look at how it does take over, come back in a few years, the whole thing will be covered with Japanese hops. All right. So there are mechanical means. We can go after some of this with mechanical means. They sell various grippers and rippers and pullers. Um, you know, I personally know guys that will, especially with honeysuckle, because it's a weakly rooted plant, they will go in and they can tear it out when the ground is soft uh, and be quite successful. It is not that well rooted. There are others that are heavier rooting or in heavier soils and you begin to look at some mechanical means to to rip it out by the roots and or mulch it and even by mulching we're still in most cases going to have to come back in after they re-sprout how many of you have buckthorn yeah new no. okay so in certain spots when we were dealing along the mississippi um, we were looking at acre upon acre upon acre, tens and thousands of acres of buckthorn, you know, almost um, 100%. And we'll talk a little bit about that. They had a contractor come in and they estimated, you know, they gave them a quote as to what it was going to be to bring it in, mulch it, clear it, come back in and spray it. It was over $1,000 an acre, okay? And we started working with the Army Corps and we started looking at airborne methods of applying herbicides. And we'll talk about the timings and how, how effective that was. But there are mechanical means, but a lot more sweat equity. When it's a smaller infestation, if you catch it early, that is always an option that's on the table. Once that infestation gets large, depending on the plant, you're almost always going away from this method or you're moving more and more into a mechanized 
attack on that plant. But there are uh, mechanical options out there. So even though that has been shredded, the more it shreds and the deeper you get into the roots, the more likely it's going to sprout less, but not always. You know, we, we cleared an area of buckthorn and then by the next year, even though it had, it had shredded it and we had ground her down into the ground, it was already knee high, a complete carpet of buckthorn. So buckthorn is one of those uh, rare animals that, that does not uh, respond negatively to, to mulching. There's also fire. I love to burn things. Fire is just a natural part of our system. And as you move kind of to the southwest, down, down through uh, um, kind of the driftless region, even down into the oaks, uh, fire is that tool that we've taken off the landscape. It is a disturbance. Things do not like normally to burn. And so they evolve, our oak systems uh, have, have evolved to burn. You do not want to burn in your sugar bush, all right? Maples are not adapted to burning. They are the asbestos forest out there, all right? Their return intervals are not like oak, uh, but it can be a very good tool for certain invasives. For others, those plants have adjusted the understory to the point that you can't run a fire through them anymore. You have to do a mechanical means to knock it down, to make that litter hit the ground and begin to dry out before you put fire on the, on the ground, all right? But again, we love to burn. It's very efficient if you know what you're doing. It's very cost effective. If the plant responds to fire negatively, then we look at that option if the system warrants it. But there's always timing, all right? And so if you're interested in fire and how to control invasives, there is a series of publications that I put out while I was at Iowa State. And so all you have to do is Google Iowa State University Forestry and fire. It's publication 2088, 2088, and it's A through F. And it talks all about prescribed fire. It talks about prescribed fire to burn uh, for invasive control. There's one on oak regeneration. There's one on cattle grazing. There's one on wildlife habitat, right? And that will go through how to burn, when to burn. Um, and that really is the manual. There's one on smoke management, which is big. So that whole fire series is available through Iowa State. And, and it really goes into detail for each of the plants that we're gonna talk about. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the fire aspect, because if I do that, we're here till tomorrow, right? Because I like to burn things. But it is a good tool in the toolbox. Herbicides. I'm going to spend a lot of time on herbicides. One, because it's one of those things that we need to know about. We need to know about the families of chemicals that are out there and what's available in the forestry world. and and some of them are harder on the environment than others, even if used in the appropriate manner. Some of the invasives that we face are gonna need to have a cocktail thrown at them, all right? So when you hear things that are in the three family, so Garlon three, Element three, Tahoe three, uh, those are mainly of the triclopyrs and they are mainly delivered in water, all right? Their carrier is water-based, all right? So anytime we're dealing with the threes, we're looking at a water-based product that will not move through the bark of plants. So you have already limited yourself to either a foliar application or you've limited yourself to a cut stump application. And I will show you what each of those means in a minute. When we go to the, the triclopyrs, the garlons, the fours, four is primarily delivered in oil, so crop oil or diesel fuel, okay? So when we do crop oil or diesel fuel, that is allowing, it, it gloms onto the herbicide and it takes it through the bark of that invasive plant, right? And so we'll talk about all of those. There's also glyphosate out there and a lot of questions surrounding glyphosate. I use glyphosate. 
I am much more respective of glyphosate and the PPE that is now used. You know, you see a lot of issues in the newspaper. Um, I still use it, but I add several layers of PPE on that, and that's protective gear that you wear. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm much more cognizant now of long sleeves, gloves. Uh, I'm more, more cognizant of when I spray, when there's no kids around, especially my three little girls. And I don't let my wife touch any clothes that I've been when I spray. I'm more worried about it. You know, I'm not going to not use it, but I'm going to use it in a much more controlled manner, like I'm using with these other ones. And for a long time, I think people looked at it as a much safer chemical than it was. And I don't think, I think they let their PPE slip a little bit when they use that chemical. Um, but it's got its time and its place, especially with some invasives and especially when we can time the application so that they're very effective, effective. Uh, and so I still throw it up there. When you get down into the amazapyrs, we're talking about a chemical that is on the micro side of things. We're talking just a minuscule amount on a per acre basis. We're talking about chemicals that we mix in with some of these others on very hard to kill plants like tree of heaven some of those. How many of you have used Tordon in your life? Piclorams, those type of chemicals. Those are, I now have gotten away from using those in almost all cases. Um, it's a soil sterilant, all right? How long do you think that resides in the soil if you misapply it or if you apply it to the point where it runs off the stem of your target plant? It sterilizes soil for about eight years, all right? And so very, you know, this is one of those that also translocates at flashbacks. Depending on the soil you have, you can kill one plant. You're not meaning to kill the other tree. You have a rainstorm. Your other tree now is dead, all right? We call it the halo of death. And I think I've got some photos in there of the halo of death. It's incredibly powerful. Um, and so, go ahead. I don't know how far down it goes is my is my honest answer. I know, um, you know, we treated some trees like this and I let the students do it because it was an applied class and we had a rain. I didn't, it wasn't forecasted, but we had a rain. I don't know how deep it went, but I can tell you my halo after that was this big. All right, so I don't know how deep. Yeah, your best luck if you have to is take it all away because it binds so efficiently to those soils. It's got such a long residence time that you're almost looking at either waiting it out or moving that soil off. I don't know if you could amend it to the point that the chemical wouldn't be there for those for several years. Have you used Pickleram? Okay, good. Okay, so. Broad leaves, again, we're looking at the triclopyrs, all right? So the safe thing there is, or the interesting, it doesn't go after your grasses. And so if you're trying to control broad leaves and, and you're worried about a rare grass or something like that, you're not going to hit it. Now, that's what the label says. We have seen on the high ends of those rates, you can scorch those and have problems, all right? So I've given you trade names. Um, the one that's really common because it's in a lot of the farm stores is called crossbow, all right? I used crossbow a lot until I got caught with a warm-up, all right? And what I do is, is um, with crossbow, we, we do a lot of cut stump or we do a lot of frill and girl, and I'll show you those in a minute. What got me in trouble was not the ester part of it. It was the 2,4-D part of it that volatilized and then you know, singe some leaves on plants that were not targeted. So the 2,4-D, anytime you deal with 2,4-D, I don't care what formulation it is, you always look at the temperature. And if you're creeping up by the 80s, you better not be using 2,4-D because uh, of its volatilization process. Okay, glyphosate comes in many different names. Um, so anytime we're dealing in a natural system, I try to use 
rodeo. All right, rodeo um, is the one that is labeled for near or in aquatic use. Um, it doesn't carry the surfactants that get the other formulations of Roundup in trouble, all right, near aquatics. It's not so much the glyphosate that is, you know, targeting, uh, you know, when you see a fish die off or you see, a, um, you know, frogs. It's the surfactant that carries the herbicide that is the problem. So when in doubt, if you have to use Roundup, use the Rodeo um, just from a safety uh, standpoint. But remember, Roundup is not selective. If it's green, it's dead, or it's gonna be really hurt. Um, and so that also goes for the stem of trees or things that you don't want to die. Uh, if you hit them with that herbicide or you misapply, it has the potential of killing the green bark on the side of that tree. And we're seeing a lot more of that in the nurseries when you buy trees that are potted or stuff and they've cleaned up around them, you're seeing more long-term implications of, of repeated glyphosate. So I have to throw it out there, all right? We have to, it, I don't care what chemical it is, you've gotta read the instructions for it. You have to have eyewear because you only got two of them all right and they're not coming back if you get the wrong chemical in there gloves good chemical resistant gloves when you're mixing good gloves when you're applying all right long sleeve shirts you know we don't like to in the middle of summer when we're doing a lot of this work wear long sleeve shirts wear a cotton long sleeve shirt change it often but you know long pants I've, I've seen it all you know i've seen the sandals in shorts with no shirt on and a backpack sprayer no gloves not really good um you know rubber boots always good because you're walking a lot of times through what you've just sprayed and so rubber knee-high boots um socks a lot of times when i'm when i'm spraying i will you know it's not socks are cheap you know you can throw them out wash everything off um keep your spray gear kind of separate from your regular family laundry, just general things you, you sometimes don't think of. Um, but always, the label is the law. Read the label. When in doubt, go safer than the label. So we talk a lot about chemical use, all right? There's a couple different means that we can apply it. And, and I talk about this in that manual at the back end of this that you, that you can use as a reference. So I, I tell you about foliar and we'll go through cut stump here in a minute. But foliar is just that. We're going after living material with leaves that are actively photosynthesizing. And so for most plants, they become photosynthetically active around 45 to 50 degrees thermal temperature, all right? Full sun, they become active and they will then be able to take up herbicides in most cases. So active leaf canopy, you're gonna want to apply it with a pressure that gives you the uniform nozzle you know, spread that you want. The droplet size is important. You want spray to complete coverage, but not to run off. You know, We have to get away from some is good, more must be better when applying, all right? And then also the one thing that, that we've learned over the years is very few of these chemicals can be applied today. And then if you don't think you got it, you can't come back the next day and apply. There's a timeline where that plant is pulling that chemical in and it's not really wanting any more to be sprayed on it or it's not gonna take it in anymore. So you have a, a respray period if you don't kill it and you have to abide by that or you're just wasting chemical. Okay, non-ionic surfactants or surfactants. Surfactants, think of like soap, it's a spreader. And why is it important? Because a lot of leaves out there have a waxy coating, all right? It's, it's a, a part of their physiology. And so a water droplet, if, if it's a waxy coat, stays really nice and balled up. That spray is just impacting the leaf right here and it's translocating through that waxy cuticle um, of that leaf in that very small area. And if we put some surfactant in it, it spreads that out and it's more efficient. Again, follow the label. If it calls for a surfactant, use a surfactant because you'll actually have to use less chemical out there. All right. Really important if those leaves have any amount of hair on them, all right? Guard hairs, 
because they can literally hold that droplet right off the leaf and it ne I get calls, why didn't I, you know, kill this, you know, invasive? Well, did you put a surfactant? Oh, well, I didn't actually read the label and if you didn't put a surfactant, the herbicide in most cases never even hits the leaf to the point where it can work. All right, we have a lot of different means of delivering it. And, you know, I get a lot of smirks when they see the plane, all right? When we have large infestations, we are now turning more and more to air tractors. If the chemical is a true non-native invasive, if it is growing well past when our native trees and shrubs and plants have senesced, think buckthorn. It's green well into the fall after the leaves have fallen. So the Army Corps has taken to spraying with a plane. They spray rodeo, 4%, 5% with drift down. One application at $35 an acre sets the buckthorn back about four to five years. They can't do it any cheaper any other way and it's effective. You have to wait for the first or second killing frost. That first or second killing frost triggers buckthorn into translocating as much nutrient and resource into its root system. Well, if you wait till the first or second frost and then spray it, guess what it translocates into the roots? The herbicide to kill it. When we go after an invasive, it may feel good to kill the top of the plant, but you're just gonna make the roots mad if you don't kill the roots. So most of the time I target invasives are in the fall when it's pulling things down, all right? There is one in here that I do target in the spring a little bit, but we'll get there. Backpack and, and all of these. How many of you, go ahead. Hold your breath as long as you can. No, I'm kidding. No, a lot of times you're right. A lot of times those guys are either out there um, with, with a fungicide or an insecticide. Um, and I don't, I am not an ag. I'm a forester. So I can't tell you what you're flying through. But most of, or, the or, or these. I mean, like, you said, you're cooling this. Mm -hmm. uh, Roundup, rodeo. Yep. Um, again, if it, they take great pains when they go to spray an area that, that they know it's there's not people in it. If you're out walking in an area that's open to the public and there are spray signs that, hey, you know what? They have to post it. That's part of, they have to post it and say, hey, we're going to spray on X day. There is a re-entry period of X amount of hours. And if it's that day, and you're within that, I'd turn around, get back in my car, and not hike today. You know, they have to, by law, post it. And they have to post the re-entry period. And then wait a few extra days, you know. Um, how many folks actually do spray with a backpack or something? How many of you calibrate your sprayer? One of the biggest things we see is people will buy a sprayer, and they have no idea how to calibrate their sprayer. So when, you know, I know extension in several states, they teach homeowners how to calibrate their sprayers. How many of you calibrate your sprayers in the morning? And then how many of you calibrate your sprayers at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon? Hardly any of us, right? Well, guess what? Your legs are fresh in the morning. You walk faster in the morning. If you use the same rate in the morning that you do in the afternoon, Guess what? Your legs are tired if you sprayed most of the day. You walk slower in the afternoon. You over apply in the afternoon because you're walking slower and you're applying the same amount out of that same nozzle. So I would encourage you when you go to calibrate your sprayer, calibrate it in the morning and then, you know, work all day, calibrate it in the afternoon and see the percentage difference. And again, if you're going in the afternoon, you cut down the chemical because you're still applying the same rate. You're just applying it slower and you're putting more volume out there. So you always calibrate. How many of you know your sprayer nozzles wear out? All right. They are a throwaway piece to that application uh, unit. You always, when you, you know, 
when I calibrate my boom sprayers, I time each one for a known volume and you'll see the ones that are either made wrong or they've worn out or they've got a clog and you've, you know, you constantly get one that clogs up. So you're always in there with a needle and you're picking it out. Guess what you're doing? You're changing the size of that orifice. All right. So you calibrate it. You calibrate it all the time. One, you don't want to over apply anything. You don't want to under apply. All right. So you always calibrate. I don't care if it's a brand new sprayer with brand new nozzles. You always calibrate it. Okay, cut stump. When we deal with invasives, if they're larger, then we can use this method, all right? It's a way that what we do is we cut that stem off and we expose the vascular structure, okay? And a lot of times when we, when we go in and, and we look, because they're like, man, I've had some flashback. I've got trees dry, you know, dropping dead around it. What did I do wrong? You come in and there's every stump out there and it's completely painted with herbicide. Herbicide doesn't translocate well in the xylem, all right? It translocates in the phloem, that living cell right around the edge, all right? And so where do we want to target our application? Right around the band at the bark. And, and with any of the applicators, you're always going to bleed over a little bit. If it's running off the side, it's doing you no good, all right? As soon as you go to a cut stump treatment, we can use that family of threes. So element three, garland three. And, you know, the blue is just to know where you've hit. It's a dye. A lot of the chemicals that are RTU or ready to use come pre-dyed. All right. So you can tell if you've over applied. Um, but again, you don't have to spray the whole surface. You do that. And this is what got us in trouble. You know, we did all these cut sunt treatments and it rained before the chemical had fully what was going to go into the tree, had a chance to go into the tree and it washed off the side. So there you're always looking out at the weather. When they're small, you know, when they're tiny, sitting there with a paintbrush all the way around isn't going to work. So you just kind of spray the whole thing and you know you'll get a little bit, all right? Outer one inch of the stump, that's just, it's going to run there anyway, so you might as well do it. Uh, for those that have used the Tordon, the applicators that have the squeeze bottle built in, you know, you buy it, you take the cap off, put the squeeze bottle lid on and go like this, that was meant to sell Tordon. Throw that out and get yourself a little chemical squirt bottle um, because you over apply 100% of the time with the Tordon bottles that, that uh, come with it. All right, those are the little sprayers that I like to use. You can pressurize them. You can change the nozzle setting and you can really dial in your application zone around that and become much finer at applying it. All right, we've already talked about that. That's what I like to use. You can buy them online, they're chemical. Uh, so if you've taken chemistry, uh, you, can, you can buy those bottles. You can really deliver it in a, in a controlled manner. All right, I away. there we go. Cut stump and girdle. Again, I don't want to cut the whole tree down. I want to leave the top standing. And so I can just go in and ring it with a chainsaw or an ax. I can frill it like the one on the left over here. I'm just exposing the vascular structure. And so I can squirt the herbicide in. Um, again, this is being over applied, all right? So you see it running down the stem that herbicide is just going to wash off. It's not going to go into the tree. This is the family of threes. Yep. Yep. Now, when you do cut stump, you know, you can buy this chemical concentrated and you want to mix it down. So it's a, a 25 uh, to 50% solution. You don't need to go 100%. So you mix it uh, with water, add in dye if, if you're buying it in bulk. Um, and then, you know, just spray. Now, if, if you're in a timber stand and you're trying to thin out a timber, let's say it's a sugar bush, and you're killing other sugar maples around it to open it up, all right? You don't ever use chemical, all right? Why don't I want to use chemical if there are like species around it? So if there's other sugar maples around that I want to 
the root system. So like trees have root grafts in a lot of cases when they're close by. Herbicide that is being pulled down can move through those roots and go from tree to tree to tree. And you can have incidental kills. Now, if I was killing an oak tree in my maples, am I okay to use chemical? Probably, all right? A lot of times when I'm in a stand and I can't use chemical because of of the uh, surrounding trees and the issues we might have, I'll double girdle, or I'll triple girdle, or I'll girdle and then I'll shave off the bark. So some species, hickories, basswood, some maples, they can bridge the girdle. They can jump the girdle and form so new wood and a vascular structure that they don't die. So I've seen them jump double girdles, hickory especially, and, and so really you're, you're faced with knowing your tree's physiology. Most of the time, a double girdle is gonna kill it if you're not dealing with those. It depends on what your objectives are. You know, I a lot of times, um, if, I'm in a, if I'm in a stand and that tree is fairly shade, um, intolerant meaning it needs full sunlight most of the time and it was up in the canopy and you cut it down and it sends up suckers it's a loser anyways you know let the deer eat them uh, i really unless you want them to to die i normally just let those suckers grow um, now if it's an ironwood or something that we don't want out there then we have to look at a chemical control or you just keep cutting them down and weakening that tree but there are some trees out there that are awfully hardy and they will just keep sprouting you can if you want sprouts. So we, we did, uh, um, you know, we cut them down, we girdled them, we girdled and treated, and if you don't girdle and treat, or cut and treat, you just make it mad. It's gonna sprout back. Um, and, you know, honestly, if, if you're looking at deer brows or you need deer brows, they will eat ironwood new regrowth. Once it gets up a little higher, they're not gonna touch it, but they, in high populations, they'll eat it. So. No, it's going to come back. The higher you cut, again, you're looking, so sprouts are adventitious buds, you know, and, and so the higher you go, the less buds you will have form, and, and the, it stresses the plant more. Timing stresses the plant. So if you look at, at uh, a tree, when it flushes its new leaves, it's pulled everything out of that tree from a piggy bank standpoint to pay the cost of growing leaves. You cut it down, it hasn't had a chance to pay back into the piggy bank. So you're stressing that tree more by timing the, the harvest or the cut of that tree. But if you wait until late fall to cut the tree down, it's pulled all of its nutrients, it's produced all of its photosynthate for the year, put it back into the stem, you cut it off, the piggy bank has been repaid and it's gonna sprout like crazy. So yeah, cut it high and time your time your application. Cut it high and cut it in the spring. Cut it high and cut it in probably June. Yeah. June, you know, whenever, look at the timing. You don't want those leaves just as they reach full expansion, but before they can really function to pay back into the piggy bank. Does that make sense? Okay, off target injury. This is the halo of death that we talk about. This was applied to the tree. This is a zone of death that goes on. Sometimes along the roadways you'll see this teardrop shape in the ditch where they've killed the tree or the shrub and it, it comes down because the chemical will move with rainwater in the soils depending on the soil. So if you're on sand, things water moves differently than if you're in heavy clay. Herbicides move differently in clay versus sand. Anybody know what this is? really classic where you have those oak leaves maples will do it they'll cup and they'll curl and a lot of times they'll twist at a 90. it's 240 all right and so what i'm looking for here is it fattens out that that main vein it flattens it out and a lot of times it'll twist it at a 90 all right going going off so that's 240. that was somebody treated their lawn with a weed and feed and it rained on a hot day, it volatilizes. Weed and feed has 2,4-D in it. Weed and feed has dicamba in it. Dicamba does bad things to tree roots, all right? Shrub roots, 
your garden will uptake it. So be very careful around your trees that you want to get a product out of or you don't want to die. Just, just know what you're putting on the ground and read the label. All right. Now start, I don't even know what time it is. We're going to have to, you'll just have to shut me down. 5.11, what is it? 4.11. We're good for, what, 20 minutes? Okay. This is in no specific order, all right? This is kind of that manual that now we're going to go through and we can talk about. But I am not going to go into, you need to hit this with 2% herbicide. That, you can come back to this talk. You can print it off or listen to it later. Um, but we're going to go through these. And all of these are either here or coming, all right? How many people have garlic mustard in their woods? Yeah. That you know of. So a lot of things carry it. Mowers carry it. Your, your shoelaces carry it. Deer carry it. Um, I kept saying, not yet, not yet, not yet. And then I walked over the hill of, of my place in Iowa, and there it was. And I've been trying to eradicate a small patch this big um, with all means possible. So when you have an infestation, it's a biennial plant. So you'll have a million little guys, and you'll have a few big guys, all right? You go after the big guys first because they're going to seed, all right? And this plant right here is garlic mustard. If I pull that plant, have I effectively stopped the infestation? If I leave it on the ground? Once it forms a flower, there is enough water in the plant that if you pull it, some of those flowers will complete the life cycle and make a seed. We've had enough experience now where people have pulled it thinking they've done well, put it into a pile. So they've, they've at least contained it. And this is one that you can pull in the spring, put it into a pile, and now they come back the next year and there's all these millions of little guys. They've completed the life cycle, even though they thought they had killed it. So when you're at this stage, you do a couple things. Go ahead. Is that mustard, or is that a different mustard? Is the yellow flower? Hmm? That's garlic mustard. Is that white or yellow? This is white. Yeah. There's other garlic. There's other brassicas out there. There's other brassicas out there. Okay. There's a lot of brassicas out there. This is the most aggressive one that we see in the timbers. Um, so what we're now telling people, if you have that and you have the ability to, to put it on a burn pile, put it on a burn pile. If you have the ability to bag it up and let those bags sit and heat up and then burn them, do it. If you have the ability to put it in a bag, let it heat up, then put it in a dump somewhere, do that. If all else fails, bag it up and give it to your neighbor. I'm kidding, don't give it to your neighbor. All right, very widespread. It's one of those that when you start to look for it, you see it everywhere and when it's really bad, it's everywhere. And there's some folks looking at the, the, the allelopathic effects of garlic mustard, so the roots exuding a chemical. There are others that are looking at just, it, it usurps all of the space and so nothing can grow up under it because it's acquired all of the space and all of the root zone. Um, I buy a little bit of both out there, um, but again, this we can, we can kill. That's what it looks like when it really gets bad. All right, and, and I have seen 20 to 30 acre timbers, just that's all you see is garlic mustard. Is that something that goats will come in and raise? They will, but they are, so they'll hit normally that second plant. This is another one we can use fire for if we time our application in the spring because they will come out early. You can burn it. If you get a dry day, you burn it. You run the risk of killing some of the other native forbs if you, if you have that timing just slightly off or if you don't recognize that they are beginning to grow. So just know you're going to set it back. You're not going to completely control it. All right. Just gives you a close-up of the first-year plant and the second-year plant. Okay. Garlic mustard stays in the seed bank for up to five years, which means if I eradicated everything today, for the next five years, I'm going back out because the seed is going to germinate and grow. Five years minimum on that seed bank. So any of the invasives that we have and that we try to control, it's not a one and done. There is nothing easy about any of the invasives. 
we catch them early, it's much better off, all right? You're going to be out there every year looking at it. Clean your shoes. If you know you've been in the timber, always clean your shoes before you go into another timber. If you've gone to your neighbors or to a friend's and you've walked around, make sure your clothes are clean before you go into your own, all right? Honeysuckle. How many folks have honeysuckle? Okay, this is another one that is just... The beekeeper in me, I love it because it really flowers early. It's really fragrant. The bees seem to love it. It's one of those that we can kill by pulling. We can kill it with some fire or we can set it back. But the problem is I can do everything on my property. The neighbors don't. It's a bird dispersed invasive. All right. So the birds are going to eat the fleshy berries, which I'm going to show you here in a minute. They fly. It's a diuretic, so the birds are, you know, mid-flight and out. It comes out the back end because that's what it's designed to do. Um, what's really cool is both honeysuckle and buckthorn. Some of the newer work that's coming out really is showing a decline in overall forest growth. You know, the the growth rings of trees are showing a reduction in some words up to 50 percent reduction in your growth rings remember anything that slows your trees down makes them not able to overcome an insect or a disease or an ice storm or a drought it makes it harder for those trees so we never try to do things that will slow growth down on our desired trees and this is one of them and we're just learning about those impacts now you know it, it does take out nutrients it does take out water it's an additive it's also changing our mid layer all right it intercepts a lot of sunlight which means the natural flora underneath can't form like it used to all right so this one takes both the mechanical it can take a chemical it can take fire to kind of bring this back in but again and i'll show you kind of some ids uh, it's got these stri the striated bark. You crack it open, it's almost always hollow. That's one of those, or it's yellow. Really fleshy berries. Again, the birds love it. Beautiful, fragrant flowers. So from a beekeeping standpoint, don't ever spray it if there's pollinators on it. All right, I hate to be that way. Um, or if you have to, if, if that's the only time of the year that you can get off of work to go spray it, do me a favor. Don't spray it until late in the day. You know, I, as a beekeeper, I still use chemicals on our farm in Iowa. What I did is I waited till my bees were asleep. You know, I waited till this has mostly dropped its flowers so the bees weren't attracted to it. If I couldn't do that, I waited until nightfall. Normally, my bees are going back to the hive by 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock. Still had enough daylight to spray. All right. This is what I'm not going to cover. This is what you can go back to uh, and, and get the manual of. This is what I would use. This is why, when I would use it, how much I would use uh, for that. And, and what you can all do with it. Either cut stump, foliar, hack and squirt, basil bark. This is also where I will have a mechanical or a fire option, okay? And so I'd rather we look at all of the other ones. And you're, you're going to see almost always when there's a fleshy fruit involved, you're looking at a bird dispersed plant, all right? Autumn olive. How many folks have autumn olive? It's coming. Russian olive, autumn olive, anytime you have the olives. Um, we're our own worst enemy. Most of these were brought in for wildlife habitat, for wildlife cover, for wildlife food. Every state DNR. I'm not picking on Wisconsin. I'm not going to pick on Michigan because all of them did it. They all brought in these things that they thought were good for wildlife. And guess what? They, they were great for wildlife. They're just not good for our natural systems. So it alters the fuel, all right, when these are really dense. So if you have a dense thicket of autumn olive, good luck burning through it. Those leaves are not naturally designed to burn. They don't dry out right. It changes the microclimate underneath. So if we want to use fire, we got to knock these down and kind of grind them up a little bit. We do that in the summertime. All right? We do it in the summertime where we knock these down. The plant begins to dry itself out. If the leaves were on the tree when it drops over, 
they suck the moisture out of the tree and then shrivel up and die. It then allows that plant to re-sprout a little bit through the rest of the summer. You now have dry litter of the plant and in the fall you can burn. Okay, I could have covered that one. Multiflora rose. You shake your head. It's horrible, isn't it? It it's just god awful. It's got horrible thorns. Again, how I attack this one, I can brush hog it and set it back so it's manageable. A lot of these things are yay tall or taller, you know. And and how are you gonna spray and cover it? And how are you going to spray and not hit things you don't want to hit? So what I do is I try to knock it down. If it's, you know, yay big, I'm going to knock it down with a brush mower. Let it start to re-sprout. All right. What I'm targeting, and if the plant's only like yay big, the weakest point in that plant is right after it's flowered. And so I'm watching as those, uh, the petals of the flowers begin to fall. I then am coming in and I'm going to hit it. All right. And... I've used all of the above. I've used the crossbows. I've used the 240s. I've used um, the, just the straight triclope ears to get at these guys. But there are native roses out there, all right? So you got to be careful, you know, that you're not getting the native. These guys have those wicked thorns all the way along the stem. Natives only have thorns, and I'm going to draw a blank on where the thorns are. They do have native, the natives do have thorns. They're just not all the way along the stem. Okay, buckthorn. This is just the bane of all forestry because it's it's taking over the middle canopy. Um, you know, this is, it's an invading when you do forest management. If you open up the canopy, buckthorn seems to be the only thing that takes off, all right? It's got, again, the dark fleshy bear. It's got that thorn at the end of the terminal bud. It's a really good way to figure out if you have it um, fairly, you know, it's a glossy, it's also called glossy buckthorn, common buckthorn. Um, and again, we can treat it with a variety of different chemicals. Um, you're almost always faced with, but it can create an impenetrable, a monoculture in your understories. Imagine having a sugar bush with this in it. Anybody have a sugar bush with this in it? It's a pain to work in, isn't it? I mean, you're... You get lost in there. Ironwood. Ironwood, we've seen a real resurgence, so I've put it as an invasive, but it isn't, all right? The reason I throw it into my invasive talk is because it's one of the things that deer don't eat, okay? So we're seeing more and more ironwood in areas with higher deer populations because it, they don't prefer to browse on it, so it grows at the expense of everything else. Now, from a wildlife standpoint, they really do like eating those, all right? It's called like hop hornbeam or false hornbeam or false hop because these look like hops, all right? Every one of those has a seed. Every one of them will grow. But we, a lot of times, we'll do the cut stump or basil bark on this, all right? Burning bush. I hate to admit it, but as an undergrad, I took pride in being able to, to root. We had classes about, in horticulture, about rooting these things. They root well, they're gorgeous. They, what's that? Oh, you, yeah, you, you can still buy it. This is now on my hit list. It, I mean, beautiful. I, you know, it, it's gorgeous, but we gotta kill it. Um, we're seeing more and more of this out in the middle of nowhere. As you go east, we're seeing more and more have escaped. And, you know, part of our problem, in, at least in the hort industry, they, they find a new product, they, they don't have the time to do the research to know if it is going to be a problem because they got to bring it to market. They can't wait for a life cycle on this to know what it's going to do or they never have a new product. So we get ourselves in trouble, um, you know, beautiful, beautiful red in the fall. Anybody know about the native burning bush? The euonymus that is native? You can find it. It's really pretty. I would encourage you to use the native, not this one. All right? 
Privet. Anybody have Privet? It's coming. So this is another one that acts a lot like buckthorn, um, where it just forms dense mats that are 15 to 20 feet tall. Um, again, really, really showy flowers. Shoot. You're supposed to see a very pretty wreath with some very orangey colored berries that they, or red, that they tie onto the wreath as, as uh, ornaments. They would put it on your front door. Guess what? Learn to really like those. Birds. They got this because they were making a lot of wreaths or the, the, the um, bittersweet cuttings were coming in. This plant gets out. This plant strangles your trees. You know, this plant is a hundred times worse than grapevines in a new tree planting or in any tree planting. So we had one vine that was six inches in diameter when we cut it. But what it does is it's like a girdling, what are those girdling figs where it'll go up through or strangler figs. This is the tree we want and that is Oriental Bittersweet going all the way to the top of these 60 and 80 foot trees and then it runs like kudzu over the top of the trees. Again, it's it's keeping out the sunlight from those trees, but it also hangs on into the fall. Guess what happens in certain parts of the country in the fall? You get ice storms or you get an early snow and then you have all of this canopy that was not, the trees never designed to hold that much weight up and then the whole thing comes crashing down. And so you see this a lot of times this is getting a footing in wetter areas all right and and so look in lower areas look along streams because it will float when it comes crashing down into the rivers it is different so you really want to know what you're killing the native doesn't form this aggressive when you see this it's by the time you understand what it is and how bad it is it's it's everywhere you know, it's up into the trees and running um, and, and girdling and, and strangling trees. All right, so again, bird dispersed. Um, after you disturb the site, it can really take off. So it does have uh, some seed longevity out there. Tree of Heaven. How many have heard of Tree of Heaven? Allianthus altissima. This thing is scary. You can hit it with herbicides. You can hit it with picloram, the soil sterilant, and it just laughs at you and keeps on coming. So we had one at Iowa State out. It was growing. We cut it down. We treated it. It shriveled up. A month and a half later, it was six feet tall, and it didn't even look like we hit it, and that was with Tordon. That, I mean, the ground around it was bare because we had hit it so hot tree didn't care. The mama plant will feed the, the little ones. The little ones will feed the mama plant. It is terrifying. What's terrifying about this one is it is an alternate host and the overwinter host for a lot of the new invasives. So the spotted lanternfly that's coming out east that hits almost all agronomic crops, all fruit crops. It hits your garden. Um, this is where it overwinters in a lot of cases and spends first part of its generation in, right? And we're seeing enough of it out there that it can hopscotch now across the country. It is that tough of a plant. It looks a lot like a walnut leaf, only much bigger, right? And almost always you'll see a lot of little ones. You start looking around and there'll be one big giant mama tree and that's the one you target. And then you go out from there and get all the other ones you can. Mulberry, how many folks have mulberry around here? This is another one and we're seeing people plant this. You can find it in, you know, the, the, the garden magazines, the fruit magazines, they're selling mulberries. There are native and there are non-native. This is the non-native. Um, so fleshy berry, anything with a fleshy berry, the raccoons love this, the birds love this. I eat this, unfortunately. I mean, it makes great jams and jellies. And, you know, my girls love it. They, they eat it just like you would a, a blackberry because that's exactly what it looks like. They're pretty darn good. They grow everywhere. They're in the ditches. They're in the drainage waste. They're in the timbers. Um, it's one of those that one is good. When you have one, you're going to have 
300 of them. You just know you got to fight it. Hops. We've already talked about Japanese hops, but this can be in one year. It can establish, and then the next year it's covering everything. Tree planters, it'll grow right up and grow right over that stuff, and it sticks. To it. All right. So we can pull it, we can make it mad. Um, it's got a relatively short lifespan. It's a three year seed bank. So we can, if we hit this one repeatedly, go after it for a year. Um, let me see, I don't think it will play probably, but this is actually a video of a, of a hunter who is looking for his deer and he's walking through this and didn't know anything about it, but he was complaining about how hard it was to walk. And if you look, the entire thing is Japanese hops. They're growing up about six feet on every tree. And when he pans to look for his deer, the entire river valley is that. There is no native plant there. It's climbing up the trees. And he's stumbling through it because it's a vine that just intertwines. Um, but you can see more and more of this now on the river bottom. So after you know it fills in the river bottoms, it then works up onto the higher ground. Okay, barberry. How many of you have barberry that you've planted? Well, my wife's grandfather planted it back in like the 60s. And yep, so they have a berry, things move, and this has, you know, barbs on it. Every one of these little tufts have barbs in it. And, you know, I was driving around Michigan and we were going to this camp 20 miles off the main road. I mean, we had bounced back in there 20 miles and I look over this fall, and that's what I find. And guess what? It was an old, I mean, when they settled the ground and broke the ground, there was an old farmstead in there. They had planted one, and it now covered hundreds of acres. So I came out of the woods, and I talked to our extension forester who's in the office, and he's like, oh, yeah, that's actually really common it's from central UP west, out in the middle of nowhere. I mean... <laughs> This thing is a tangled mess. There's not a lot of regen in there. And, you know, it's horrible when you're running lines and you're falling around tripping in things that have barbs on them. All right? It's just not fun. The problem that we see here is you can't, you know, you can burn in the fall. You can't really spray in the fall because it doesn't hold the leaves like a buckthorn. It isn't going to be translocating chemical that far into the fall. So you're really limited how you, how you attack, you know, attack this thing. Um, and it's, it's gonna be a combination, but look for it. And when you find it, do it. All right, it's pretty much the end of this. You know, I know there's a few more, but I think we're out of time. Again, just follow the same guidelines. If you're gonna use a chemical, use it wisely, read the label, follow the rates. I would look at using a, a combination of all of them if you have it. Mechanical, chemical, the burning. Be a good neighbor, know what your neighbors are doing, you know, and, and if they're trying to control theirs, try to control yours. There is cost share available to control invasives. All right? There's even more cost share available to control invasives than there are for just straight up forest management out there because the, the state and the federal have, have realized this is such a problem, a lot of it you do not have to do yourself, or if you do it, you can get reimbursed for your time, for your equipment. So don't think you have to go it alone. Talk to your local forester, go into the NRCS office or FSA office, see what they have available. And just know it's gonna take a while to do the paperwork. There's always paperwork with the feds. And start now and don't plan, you know, just give them some time to do their thing or, you know, you're going to leave money on the table if you don't use those programs. All right, last slide. Seed banks of some of the most common ones that we see. You know, bittersweet's down here, probably the best at the three, Tree of Heavens three. We start coming out here. Multiflora rose. Its seeds are viable for 25 years in the soil. So just because you eradicated on your farm this year doesn't mean your kids aren't going to be dealing with the seed source in 25 years. That's the scary part. And this Circea lespediza, that's coming up from the south. Um, you know, we're having 
kind of that line of Circe is is right around I-80 in Iowa, and we're seeing a little bit of it creep higher. I put it there because we got it when uh, the the overnight campers would would come up from the south. They brought their own hay to feed the horses as they went trail riding in the southern part of Iowa. So campgrounds are a really good place to check for this. And it's coming with hay because it's sold as hay or it gets into the hay. So look for your campgrounds. Don't let people come to your place if they're bringing hay out of state. So anyways, with that, I'll take questions.